uh, 10 part series uh, for the patrons of my um, games. Um, this session, uh, well, the, the series will be called The Greater Key of Gressel. Um, this session is entitled The Great Gig in the Sky. Um, so, um, the um, cast of this specific series of adventures, and some of them are not currently visible, uh, but will come into play uh, in the future, um, are mages from across the ages that are performing their tasks as ordinary and mundane um, to them as ever. Simple things that they would have been doing, um, you know, just day to day, uh, moving through um, time and space in a normal fashion. Then suddenly, a flash of pure energy rips through uh, the spatial reality that they are in and bypasses all their magical defenses before lashing onto them and dragging them unwillingly through space and time. The space between spaces and the moments before, during, and after that never come race past the corporeal bodies of the mages until finally depositing them on a cloud. Uh, far beneath them, the world of Urz, where they all come from, uh, can be seen, but it seems to ripple and undulate as if everything were happening at once. The cloud before the mages begins to take shapes um, of swords and other bladed weaponry that slam together before you to form an ascending path higher up into the cloudy blue sky. Uh, before the mages, the apex of the steps of swords and blades, uh, there's a massive gate made of gold that appears. It seems to continue up from where it begins, high up into the blue of the sky, uh, unendingly so. Uh, the uh, gate is um, straddled by two um, angelic-looking knights, um, statues of two angelic-looking knights, um, and there is a bit of a landing out before the, uh, the door. Um, as you approach, you can also see that the clouds that kind of form up around and the blades that kind of form out and around it, uh, you can see the wisps and tracers of what appear to be other sentient beings kind of moving about, uh, making expressions, surprise most common amongst these visages. And out from the smoke, from your own, out from the clouds rather, from your own uh, apparent visual uh, spectrum, you see the other mages who are present start to manifest more fully out of these mists. That said, uh, we're going to go ahead and just move from left to non around in a circle as I'm viewing you. So that means, Steve, you're going to be leading first. Uh, your mage appears and is visible to everyone. What exactly do they see? Um, they would see a tall, thin man, pale skin. Uh, kind of sunken cheeks, almost looks borderline malnourished. Um, he wears kind of a uh, longish leather, um, kind of a, almost like a robe, but more of like a tunic. And it has kind of a strong gash in the chest. And he kind of looks down and he brushes it a bit. And as he's kind of brushing it, it the leather kind of morphs into this very fine um, purple uh, black robe with uh, purple trim and a chain forms along uh, midway down with several skulls kind of looped through the eyes and it's a very he goes from kind of looking kind of um, gaudy to like very fine proper um, in one end he holds a tall staff it's about as tall as he is um, etched onto it are a mix cool mixture of, of dwarven runes as well as kind of like a runes worldly lash that probably not many people could speak and at the top of the staff are th uh, three leathery tentacles that kind of sway and coalesce in this kind of just hypnotic pattern they seem to be coalescing around this orb of just per blackish purple energy that just kind of hovers in the middle of these three tentacles and um he just kind of seems to be observing his things trying to make ends meet of what's exactly happening and above his head kind of bobbing um, haphazardly was seems to be a tiny beholder can with three eye, with four eyes just kind of aim also looking very perplexed at what we odd reality it was pulled into as you um, look around uh, you would see that um, the 
closest kind of manifesting individual to you. Again, tokens are kind of just placed haphazardly um, for no purpose at all. Um, Andy, uh, your character would be manifesting pretty close to uh, Eslo. Uh, rather, sorry, apologies. Introductions have not been made. Um, <laughs> Steve's character. Um, that said, um, as you kind of see each other and kind of look towards one another, the both of you hear kind of a sickening kind of ripping and tearing of skin and what sounds like liquid splashing on the stone. This sound Close. appears to be coming from closer to the doors. And when you kind of look in that direction, there's some sort of coalescing of these mists out in front of the doors. But so far as to say, whatever might have caused that sound has not taken form. Go ahead and describe your character, Andy. So what you see before you is uh, a tall, thin man in late middle age, mostly gray, longish beard. Uh, his robes are not nearly as fine as you might expect for someone to be in this group. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see ink blotches and stains uh, along the edges of his robe, especially on the, the sleeves. Um, he's carrying a large spell book um, and uh, it's you see it's glowing a little bit and beside him is a smaller spell book it is a little spectral uh thing that's that's floating and hovering nearby him okay all right sorry i was having some cat issues no worries um okay um as you kind of manifest the two of you kind of look in that general direction um the uh, next closest would be uh, Brent. Um, and as you kind of are being revealed here as well, kind of taking uh, your place on this, uh, this kind of open platform, um, all of you kind of see what appears to be um, uh, strands kind of moving in towards that form, kind of shaping around it. Um, and the thing that you're noticing most um, is that these strands all seem to have kind of different colors to them and kind of different textures to them as well. Very strange, but kind of coalescing in this misty form in the center. That said, Brent, tell us about uh, what your character looks like. Muted. Still muted. Huh. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move past you for a second. Fix your audio. Let us know when you got it. Uh, we're going to snap to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your character. It's kind of neat that, that we're swapping the two um, Dragonborn, so that's fine. <laughs> but yeah, tell us about your character as you manifest near them. All right. What you guys would see is up towards the front, I just pinged him, is a tall but thin dragonborn. You would notice he has black scales. He, um, he has the forward, like uh, forward pointing horns of a black dragon. He is a black dragonborn. And at this moment, you would notice that what he is doing is he has thrown an extra dimensional space onto the ground and is pulling out a couple ghouls, three to be exact, all dressed up in um, like black robes with belts and hoods down. So, you know, unless you looked closely, you couldn't really tell that they were ghouls. You might just think they're his assistants. But he has a staff in his hand and you know, other than that, he's kind of looking pretty chill. Is my mic working now? Yes. Okay, it was picking up the wrong mic is what it was. Perfect timing. Um, so as you see this um, other dragonborn deposit an extra dimensional space and pull out uh, dead bodies and neat clothing, um, you um, also, a lot of you would see the shaping kind of manifesting at the, uh, the, the stairs up on the dais. Um, it looks like the uh, strange colors are actually manifesting as bolts of cloth with different patterns and colors to them. And they seem to be shaping around a human-like form. 
and as you kind of see that kind of shaping, the one thing that stands out from this is in the center of this mass is a golden gauntlet. Articulate as all get out, very ornate, very patterned, very uh, etched with kind of um, uh, ornate kind of acid etching. Um, it looks like the, uh, it covers the entirety of this hand or would cover the entirety of the hand. And it looks like the uh, fingers are long, um, uh, like blade-like talons and they seem to be kind of holding on to something in the smoke or in the mist. Um, Brent, go ahead and describe your character. Right. Uh, since you can hear me now, uh, you see a blue, or not blue, silver dragonborn. He's wearing a blue robe, like a light blue robe to kind of match close to his skin color. And it has like fine gold trim going around him. And he's got uh, just a spell book in one hand. And he's looking around very curiously. He's very confused as to how he was here. Okay. Um, as we get to the last of you, uh, the form um, takes a final a finality, uh, and you see it uh, for what it is. It appears to be a figure, a humanoid figure, completely bound um, in uh, ornate kind of just uh, cloth, but it seems that they are very tackily kind of uh, thrown together. Like there isn't very much concern for um, uh, what goes together or what would be considered fashionable. The cloth covers this person from head to toe. There doesn't appear to be an inch of flesh visible to you. The only thing that seems to be notable inside of it is a small section where an eye appears to be present, but where an eye would be is instead just a crystal of perfectly red kind of crystal, possibly a ruby, uh, saddled kind of in the spot where an eye would be. And that golden hand seems to be holding something that's taking its full form. Um, at that, uh, last but not least, Chad, describe your character to us. It's definitely be the funniest one, I think. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry, folks who are watching at home. This is the first time we've done Zoom as a, a group for the D&D &D side, so um, just Zoom. We usually use Discord for audio, but... Right. I'm still over here, like, trying to push the talk. No uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, this is a very physically imposing individual. In, individual. Like, uh, he's basically got the proportions of, like, Brock Lesnar. Um, uh, he's covered almost completely head to toe um, in armor that's made out of some strange metal with, like, a, a, a pale blue or green patina to it. Um, has a couple glowing red nodes studded across the armor. Um, set into the middle of his helmet is a, a golden plate with a glowing red eye in it, as well as a uh, red visor that covers his eyes. Um, in one hand, he has a you know a strange device that uh, some of you probably haven't seen. Um, it's got a wooden handle. Uh, it seems to be made out of a, a series of metal cylinders, um, and it seems to be smoking a little bit. Um, in his other hand is uh, the crushed remains of what looks like a head made out of metal um, with, you know, bits and pieces uh, falling off of it. And as he looks around and surveys the motley assortment of individuals, uh, his gaze lingering on the guy pulling ghouls out of a hole in the ground, um, he glances at the head in his hand and then tosses it aside. Um, floating in the air beside him is a metallic orb that's made out of, um, it looks like it's made out of a series of metal plates uh, that's like spinning um, almost frantically as it is also looking around. Um, and this floating metal orb um, turns toward the individual that is manifesting uh, with the gauntlet and it actually starts floating towards him. Um, and as it starts to drift away, uh, this Paul individual reaches out and snatches the orb out of the air and sort of holds it back. Okay. So you keep, you keep him from going too far forward. Got it. Right. It, it looks like it's starting to get away and it's like, no. Okay. He, he just snatches it out of the air and pulls it back. Perfectly acceptable. So what you will witness as you all kind of form, there are other forms that are present but haven't really stepped through but seem to be kind of lingering in the space more closely than a lot of the forms that seem to be kind of on the outskirts of this uh, cavalcade. Uh, from what you can tell, uh, one of them appears to be a gnomish figure. Uh, it's wearing kind of a bluish hat, from what you can tell of its distorted form. It seems to be kind of corporeally coming in, and if you're close to that ghostly form, which would be 
kind of like right around here-ish. Uh, it's very loud. Um, that's all you're really discerning from it. You can't understand what it's saying, but it is very loud. Um, then there is uh, what appears to be a slender, kind of um, more uh, feminine frame near the uh, side there. Um, from what you can tell, it does appear to be a humanoid, but with kind of bluish skin and a sword. Um, but they aren't really moving. It looks like they've crossed their arms um, and are paying attention or are waiting for something. Um, there's a figure kind of closer to the dais that the only thing you can really outline from it is kind of a shock of green hair. Um, but other than that, everything's still kind of forming and not pulled through. Um, and you would also notice that there's a dwarf near there uh, that seems to be coming through, but it's probably because their children um, were just the worst. Oh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Jeremy, our, uh, one of our Canadian friends, uh, was unfortunately pulled away. He was going to be uh, in there. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, that said, uh, oh, sorry, another one. Um, halfling figure, red cloak, very fine looking garb. Um, and apparently their staff has a hand at the top of it. Um, that said, um, a cloaked figure fully manifests at the steps, walking up. When the figure finally manifests, you realize they're wearing a black cloak, which Eslo you immediately recognize as the cloaks of a Meridian senator. You can see the lines of their runes on their internal frame. They are someone of importance in Meridian culture. Where a face would be, instead there is a porcelain mask, and on that porcelain mask is a blood-red handprint. You can see where a body would be underneath the cloak. Uh, instead, there are worms moving about. Um, apparently, this figure is nothing more than a walking uh, pile of worms wearing a cloak and a mask. And last but not least, finally manifesting. In the hands of the golden gauntleted individual, you see the head of an old man appear. And you can see another hand, uh, this one also gauntleted with a blade tearing backwards, and you hear a sickening pop as the head is pulled off of the body, and the body falls to the ground in a splash of blood, and basically just starts bleeding out onto the ground. Um, as that happens, the uh, individual in the massive amounts of robes kind of looks at you all. Obviously a bit of a, like a hushed kind of pause as this old man kind of appears, head pulled off, body thrown to the ground. Um, it's red eye kind of looking around. You hear a voice emanate from the robes and says, Welcome. He then throws the head to the side. It hits the ground, uh, kind of rolls a bit, um, probably close to Venkar. And you would see it kind of looking up at you with kind of a lifeless sort of eyes. Go ahead and roll me a history check, Venkar. Let me know what you got. Kevin, you are Venkar. <laughs> I guess I've been playing Cyberpunk too long, you forgot where history is at. Again, 18 is good enough for you because you're from the region. You recognize the dead individual as a mage that works with uh, the Ellen Shea Enclave. The mage in question is an individual known as Alfred the Untimely. Ooh, interesting. That is really interesting for the Friday <laughs> game. Yes. Yes, definitely. You're free. Just to be clear, uh, the, 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 he's dead and the one with the cloak seems to have killed him? No, the one in the weird robes with all of the fabrics is the okay, golden okay. gauntleted hand is the one who has killed him. Okay. The one with the cloak and the mask and the worms was the last mage to arrive. Um, if you are modern, um, you would recognize the, uh, the mage that just arrived, the last one, as Gideon Illuminus, also known as Gideon Albacorus, also known as the Abomination, also known as the Mistake, also known as the White Mask. He's kind of a big deal. And if you're after modern, if you're future as well, you've probably heard of him as well. You might even have taken your first name after him. He is kind of an important wizard. 
table's yours. Why have you brought us here? I did not. The, uh, pie, the ragamuffin sedates uh, in reply. Do you know who did? Looks down at the body. I do. Do you know what, the, for what purpose? To defend him. He kind gives of, a little light on that. He holds out his gauntleted hands kind of upwards, kind of blade fingernails up, kind of looking at you all with the red eye that kind of gleams. Do you wish to try? Uh, Gideon lets go of his drone and just says very softly, stay close. It hesitantly does so, uh, but it, actually it, it doesn't hesitantly do so. It probably, it's sentient, right? Um, I mean, it follows my commands. But it also um, has, like, curiosity and, like, kind of quirky, like, yeah. robot Yeah, it, it has, like, a personality. It probably floats behind <clears throat> you and kind of does, like, a little bit of a shaky kind of, like, plate bit behind you. Cause yeah, oh, yeah. That was pretty It's like, me. <laughs> no, no, it's more of a, I'm scared. That guy just cut that dude's head oh, off. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that thing's probably seen Corso kill all kinds of crazy shit. Mm-hmm. It's so you said the ragamuffin didn't kill him. He just appeared and his head fell off. No, he appears to have killed him violently. Oh. And you're kind of just he's already there. dead. How are we supposed to protect him? Well, you failed in your first um, and summoned effort. I suppose since you're here, you can instead help me with a quandary. I suppose it's a better alternative to Oblivion, which is where I was headed before I came here, so... Why should we help what? you? You don't have to, he says, uh, or, I'm sorry, they say as they kind of look at you. The bundle of cloth, it, there really isn't anything kind of telling you, uh, male or female. The voice is a bit androgynous, but there is a certain quality to it that is uh, very charming and very alluring. Um, and, uh, yeah, they kind of move about with the grace of a very powerful wizard. Um, and they obviously have the, uh, um, you know, stark contrasting kind of just blunt and brutal nature uh, that would lead them to cutting an old man's head off barehanded. Um, Corso doesn't insert himself into the conversation just yet, but he's looking around, uh, there are three things in particular that he wants to sort of try to size up um, just according to his knowledge and intuition. One would be where he's at. Okay. Uh, two would be the ragamuffin man with the gauntlets. Okay. And three would be the dude with the cloak. Sure. And the mask. So the one with the cloak and the mask, if you are modern or after, you know immediately. That is Gideon Illuminus, also known as Gideon Albacorus, also known as the White Mask, also known as um, all the things I said before. Right. Um, he is a non uh, factor. Uh, is is he Parnan? No, he's Moravian. Hmm. Yep. Um, so it, to to put this into context a little bit more, just so you have an idea of him, um, when Moradia began the Grey War, which is a very ancient war in your mindset. Um, an ancient war, or a, an older war for those of you from modernity. Uh, it was Gideon who led the Meridians. It was Gideon who created um, the Grey Reaver. It was Gideon who assaulted Osiris' White Walls. It was Gideon who started that war. It was Gideon who fought that war. Um, mm. And um, what you would know about him is, is he's also the one who, before that point, was the one who created Meridia in the first place. Moridia was just a cult inside of Osiria before that point, and he basically wanted land seized from the Osirian people up in the Dargian, or Dargian province, and he basically politicked his way into getting it. <clears throat> mm. um, yeah, he's... Uh, Corso's gonna keep his distance from that one. Yep. Uh, you would also know that he is a worm that walks. And being what you are, that doesn't mean much because there aren't many in your time frame. But 
from what you understand, it means it's a very powerful magic creature, like a lich. So Bartleby being from the past, would he know of that? Uh, no. If you are past or ancient, you would not understand that. You would know what a worm that walks is. That's old magic. Uh, very ancient magic. In fact, if you are ancient, you would know it as the very first corruption. Um, it is a bad magic. It's, uh, it's, I, go ahead. Can I try to communicate with Albuquerque telepathically? You can. I want to try to speak to him in Meridian and just ask. Oh, you are coming in weird, sir. Losing you a little uh, bit, yeah. Oh. Canada internet is apparently. Are you downloading something? <laughs> no, I turned everything off. I think it was just a stutter. My thing's been stuttering a bit. Uh, sorry, my my drone would take a particular interest in the uh, beholder, Ken. Okay. Sort of like. Sorry, did you hear the last thing I said before I stuttered out? Yeah, you said you're going to try and telepath. Uh, you don't need to actually speak the language in telepathy. It's just known languages. Oh. But yeah, that's fine. Just want to ask him what he makes of this. I, I wanted to say to Meridian just so he knows I'm like a countryman, essentially. Okay. Uh, you see the the mask kind of turn in your direction, uh, and the eyeless kind of like holes of the mask kind of stare at you. Uh, it's very kind of strange. And it replies in your mind with a thousand voices or more. Uh, you hear it say, You are an unknown factor. And then it turns its attention back towards the dais. So you said an unknown factor? Yeah, you kind of have this weird situational kind of like, you feel like you're, you've drawn the attention of something great. Uh, you've only felt this kind of feeling once before when you first signed your pact. Like, it's kind of like a, oh, uh oh, <laughs> you kind of feel like this weird weight of its uh, attention. Um, the uh, uh, orbs kind of stare off and are kind of looking at each other. Um, and, uh, yeah, the uh, ancient dragonborn is kind of looking at this thing and a bit more of disgust I presume. Um, Very much so. Bartleby, um, a lot of this isn't really reading, but I'd like for you to go ahead and make a history check. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there were two other things I wanted to go for it. check out. Oh, well, one was where am I, and the other one was oh, the yeah. guy with the gauntlets. Uh, guy with the gauntlets, um, you can give me a history check on that. Um, the uh, roll for Arcana is impossible. Um, I've already checked your guys' modifiers. No one can make it to find out where you're at. Roll the 20 on the history. Okay. You would actually recognize the silver dragonborn, uh, Rakash, um, who is a chronergist, a um, master of time. And um, I thought of a couple of cool like uh, additions to your name, Brent, and I'm going to throw them past you, but history will probably remember you in these ways anyways because they make sense. Uh, Rakash, the silver one, Rakosh the Timeless, Rakosh the Patient. Um, these are names that you know him by. I love all of those. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, before I make this roll, I'm going to go ahead and use a flash of inspiration to give myself a plus five. Okay. So you would so, recognize with a twenty-six, yeah. you would recognize Grissel. Grissel is a powerful mage, um, a master of field magic. I'm and sorry, and which one's that? Everyone would know that field magic is the art of basically creating craft magic in a field and basically dominating a specific location with powerful magic. When true old magicians, such as you know those of precocious tutelage, people who would have taught him, uh, would do battle instead of, you know, walking up to each other and being like, fireball, ooh, I got you, ha ha ha. They would set up zones and create territories, which were the very first nations, and those powerful magic zones would basically war with one another. So that that's the guy with the gauntlets? Yeah. Whoa. So that's very old. 
very old. Yeah. And is that reason, is that the only reason you no, know that? The only reason you know that is because you found a book a long time ago called The Scarves of Grissel, uh, which outlined the uh, magic, but it did not detail how it was done. So it was basically like a fan fiction instead of a like a spell book. Oh yeah, that's like um, somebody got a hold of the stories. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. Like a bard wrote a story about how cool the magic was, but not how it works. Um, and what'd you say that guy's name was? Grissel. Oh, Gris- okay. Yeah, yeah, as, Interesting. In, the, the, as in the title. <laughs> yeah. Corso, like, gives him a total, like, top-to-bottom look over, and... He's still kind of... See... He's still kind of in a come-at-me-bro kind of posture, uh, because he did offer, you know, you to help him. But at the same time, he also kind of offered for you to fight him. Uh, I'm sorry, then. Apologies. Um, because, again, I, I want to make sure that you understand. It is not... It is a very agender being. Um, it is right. not human either. <laughs> Anyways. Very come at me, bro kind of uh, mentality in its stature. Does yeah. Alpha Corpus and Gris like they're kind of like opposing to each other or is Albacore is like almost like one of us like he was brought here it looks like he was brought here okay so he's kind of on a similar playing field to us in the sense of wondering why he's here kind of thing yeah or does he seem pretty focused he seems focused like he's annoyed at what's happening and still kind of like all of you trying to figure out what's going on uh, but he does seem to be kind of focusing his attention on Grissel uh, you can make an insight check if you'd like on um, a pile of worms. Yeah, Corso's general. Go well. Corso's general stance is um, he seems to be sort of kind of taking a step back and surveying the situation. Defensive posture, not trying to interject too much, trying to keep kind of distance. Right. Uh, you are you are occasionally getting glances from what, everyone else because again, if his description wasn't sound enough, he does look like he is future man. Uh, right. But, if, I if, mean, he's no. Yeah. If you have the modern, like Corso's uh, just. Well, real quick, if you have the modern timeline, that weird thing he had that was smoking at his uh, in his hand, you would recognize what it is, but you would understand that it is far beyond what you recognize what it is. It is a firearm, but the thing he has appears to have like multiple chambers and like a, a hammer and weird bits. <laughs> Like it's yeah, it's ain't no boomstick, ain't no flintlock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like uh, from, from the drawing, it looked like a Colt single action army. But yeah, real quick too, um, there aren't many uh, doodles yet for the characters, so I'm not showing them um, on the stream. You're currently looking at Gressel because that one's finished, but everyone else, uh, their drawings are coming. Um, so be patient. <sighs> that said, back to uh, this um, with a. 14, I'll actually give you advantage for it because you are a Moraiti and you would understand the mentality. He definitely is in a... So 21, he is in a calculating stance. So what he is doing is, is he's waiting for an apparent weakness from the one who apparently brought him here or has power over him returning. Um, your assumption is, is that uh, Master Gideon is probably going over all of the different factors here and waiting for a moment to initiate. Okay. Interesting. And yeah, I've got to phase out a couple more of these folks as they start to fade further away. Um, but yeah. Can I give my homunculus mental commands? Does do my commands have to be verbal? If it's a if it uh, functions like a familiar, it doesn't have to be verbal. Well, I don't think it functions as a familiar. Let me check it out real quick. Yeah, figure your stuff out. Um, Mr. Zombie Man, or rather Ghoul, apology, don't let me, uh, they are cooler than zombies. Um, uh, yeah, you're standing pretty close, and he's mostly looking at you, uh, due to placement. Um, is there anything you want to interject, Ken? Okay. Okay, it was the audio issues, looks like. So moving to Zoom with pointless. <laughs> if you hold the space bar, you unmute yourself. Yeah, it's showing you as muted. I can click ask to unmute. That might help you. 
How about can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just observing what's going on. I'm not really saying much. I'm just kind of taking in everything that's going on and uh, kind of keeping my ghouls close. That's it. Okay. Um, but yeah, because of proximity and proximity alone, it does look like Gressel's attention is mainly on you. Um, that said, um, back to the group. So what would someone of your stature need help with anyway? Well, turns slowly, kind of looking towards the door uh, behind their shoulder. I need entry into that. Beyond is the Arch of Time which points down at the dead body, someone broke. It has been reforged, but not properly. As a master conditiomancer, I should be able to make it right. No one understands what he just said when he said conditiomancer. Okay, so if you can make it right, why do you need our help? I can't go through the door. So it's kind of like a, a gateway specifically blocking you at this point. Not specifically me, no. I'm sure the door would bar you as well. Rakosh, is it? Yes. Out of character, everyone has heard the Silver Dragon's name aloud now. Um, you... You understand what this one did, then, more than the others. The Arch of Time being broken and reforged by one of your ilk is one of the most dire sins when it comes to your school of magic, is it not? Yes, it is. So you understand why this one had to fall? Yeah. Looks to the others. You were brought here for a purpose to defend him. He wrenched you from time and space to see that you would stop me from doing what I had done. But I hope that you, Rakash, understand that my course is correct. And this one's was foul. Indeed. So, how can we help you, Bob? The door. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I understand the door. What do you want us to do? Like, you want us to try to go through it, or? Open the door. <laughs> Sometimes the most simple matters are the most difficult to explain to a group of wizards. <laughs> Very much. As, um, go ahead. Uh, uh, Corso takes one last quick look around, and then he holsters his firearm and walks towards uh, Griselt. Mm -hmm. um, and Griselt's actually walking towards the edge of the steps as well as you're coming towards what you notice mainly as you're kind of coming closer to the form is that as they're moving across the dais down to the steps the blood that's kind of pooled around uh, uh, Alfred's body um, it looks like the, the the scarves and the robes are gonna like run through it but you watch as they seem to kind of move away from it like they are sentient um, and kind of move away from the blood as Griselle kind of comes up to the steps to kind of meet you at them So, yeah, so Corso walks to where he's standing right now and takes a moment to regard Gestalt and then looks at the door and he says, what, what need of you, what need do you have with what lies beyond this door? The Arch of Time rests beyond. The Arch of Time is what makes sure that everything remains concurrent with the law of death as it is currently wounded by the one that lays dead at my feet. It needs to be repaired. To do so, I must be able to touch it, as I cannot because the door bars my way. The Gate of Eternity must be opened for me to touch the arch. So, based on my understanding of the kind of magic he uses, this sort of field magic, would I be able to put the two and two together? What two and two are you going for here, Chad? Because I'm not... Like, how? Like, 
what makes his his particular brand of magic so specialized in fixing the arch right Yeah, because the arch is a location yeah it's definitely something he's going to work towards and be able to basically rebuild it's going to be a time process like a, something that'll take some time but it's certainly going to be something to witness because it'll be power beyond what you've witnessed power right. beyond what most of you have witnessed <clears throat> um as intrigued as corso is uh what is the general do i sense any sort of like deceitfulness or uh like manipulation on his part like you can make an insight check Hmm. 20. um he seems to be forward with you. Like, it seems that he is being... Um, it sounds like this is truly his aim. Um, okay, so... Knowing that, Corso is going to walk past him and mm-hmm. step around the dead body and approach the door until he's standing right about here. And he's going to... Like, knowing what he knows about uh, I mean, he's he's proficient in a lot of things. Sure. The main thing is, is as you kind of approach the door, you'll see that the strange kind of um, spirally kind of markings, the lattice kind of look to the door, starts to kind of glow white. Uh, as that happens, you see the blades of the swords of the statues to your left and your right also glow in the same coloration. Uh, Grisil steps back further, um, and as they do so, you watch as they kind of place their gauntleted hands together and kind of place what would be a chin of the scarves kind of on it, kind of watching patiently with the bright ruby red eye. Um, And you step there, and you see the glowing lights. Um, Does it seem like what the statues were doing was they were basically becoming like more animated as I got closer? They don't move. They're just the swords are now glowing like lightsabers. Like Ahsoka's lightsabers. Bright white, just lights. Mm. Um, do I detect uh, like the workings of any particular spell or magic? You can feel magic. Yeah, as, as anybody, as all of you are casters, you know what magic feels like, but it doesn't appear to be a spell or anything. It just appears to be raw magic. So is it, uh, hmm. I mean, it's obviously reacting to my proximity, Yep. but I don't know if it's reacting to my proximity because there's something special about me or if it would just react. Do you back away? No, wait, what's his face was standing right where I'm standing and they weren't well, doing this, were they? The presumption is, is that you were moving up to the door. So placement on the map is not exactly something I'm taking to account to thoroughly so the presumption is is that you were stepping up to the door as you kind of stepped past where gressel was basically that's when the lights started to, to i got you um corso reaches into a satchel in, at his side mm-hmm. uh, he pulls out a uh, clay jug okay he sets it on the ground and he casts corso's toy on it all right if he comes an activated kind of thing you kind of see like parts of the porcelain kind of pull up the side of his legs and I presume you are going to move it towards it? Yeah, I'm going to command that, that clay. Like, the clay jug basically pops out like a Mr. Potato Head. In the blink of an like, eye, you see a flash of white light kind of siphoned from both swords, and you watch as the thing is obliterated, snuffed out of existence. <sighs> like, you see this adorable, like, comically cartoonish little construct just go waddling off, and it barely makes it, like, two feet. <laughs> evaporates as you kind of see that happen uh your construct kind of moves away like no (laughs) and you kind of (laughs) yeah you kind of step back kind of like looking at it and the white lights kind of disappear as you move yourself away from it gressel says i believe it's based on the law of death itself it being the gate of eternity um if anybody else has any other ideas gesturing to the rest of you um brent anything you want to engage in interact with Okay, there we go. Now, yeah. Corso yeah. definitely uh, steps back to yeah. like right around here. As he does, I'm gonna get. 
Wow, it was going, and then it just went mute. You muted yourself, yeah. T- I, yeah, I have to unmute myself, because when you click off of it, holding space doesn't work anymore. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to walk up as close as I can to one of the statues. Okay. As and you when ap- I get up... A- as you approach, you'll watch as the blades glow bright white. Okay, then I'm going to distance myself a little bit, like back a little, like two steps back. Okay. Um, you can make an arcana check um, if you want. I mean, you did witness the explosion of the toy. Um, and if you get it, everybody else would probably get it too. But yeah, go ahead and roll it, uh, Rakash. 14. Okay. Um, you're looking at the situation, and you're pretty sure that it's not going to try and assault you unless you're moving up to the door. Okay. So I can get, like, up to the statue? You walk over to the statue, yeah, if you want to mess with that. Okay. I'm going to go up to the statue and just look around on it and, like, investigate it. Okay. Yeah, it's made out of, um, com- it's completely made out of gold, the entirety of the statue. Uh, there are some patches on the scale work that looks like they're kind of uh, patinaed over, but they do appear to still be gold. The door is gold. The floor you're walking on currently is gold. Pillars to the side are gold, and it seems to go up for infinity. Okay. Uh, I'll walk back over to the, the guy's body and search it then, because, okay. I mean, I'm as, assuming if he can break it, he can get in there, so. As you maneuver away from the statues, you'll note that the white lights dissipate. Uh, as you move over to the dead body, you'll see that he's wearing nothing more than what appears to be burlap pants, and has nothing on his body other than that. His head is kind of over. I don't. I don't know why I didn't animate the body instead of a clay jug. I could have just force those toyed the body. <laughs> I, I don't know how I'm going to deal with that on corpses. That's a good point. So I will uh, take that into account. I don't know if it's going to work on dead bodies. Um, <laughs> it should just be objects. <laughs> I mean, I know that's... corpses are objects, but yeah. <laughs> Fair, fair, fair dues. But like, who? Now I'm a necromancer. <laughs> well, look, at, look at me! I'm stomping on Ben Carr's feet. Um, that said, um, as you back away, Rakash, and look to the body, look to Corso, who's kind of standing back from the uh, that as well. I'll let you two interact here in a second, but I want to make sure everyone else gets a chance at prodding. Yeah, I have something. Go ahead, Andy. Um, so, does the term "gate of eternity" mean anything to me? Have I come across that in my studies in the past? You can make an arcana check. Okay. So um, my ability, Mystical Conflux, lets me have advantage on this. Sure. So 17. Everyone should be kind of idly familiar with what the term Gates of Eternity mean. Um, The presumption is, is the Gates of Eternity are the blockade, the defense for the laws that were created by the most ancient deities um so beyond that you presume there's a wonder if if Chriselle is being um honest uh, there's probably a wonderland of different things beyond just the arch of time uh the staff of law the um heart of death all be beyond that door things of like next level power things of like absolute power the staff of law is said to give whoever wields it the ability to command. Um, they write the laws. The arch of time is basically something that can be used to place yourself any when you want to be in reality. The heart of death, basically whoever uh, sups from it, is no longer bound by the rules of death and will never die. Um, or if uh, the alternate um, is utilized. Um, if someone is um, basically touched by it, um, instead of allowed to suck from the heart, uh, it could kill anything, and indefinitely so. Uh, I'm going to kind of start to approach. I'm going to try to see, use my vocation to gaze, which lets me look through solid objects. You cannot see through I want to I cannot see beyond it. <laughs> yep. Um, can I see are these stat? Can I see like in the interior of these statues? Are they hollow or anything? Let me be more precise. So what you can't see through is the magic. So you're seeing through the gold and can see that the when the uh, the white light seems to emanate, it seems to be pushing out from an actual white wine barrier behind the door. 
So you're able to see that there is an absolute magical force present that seems to have kind of a white coloration, but similarly, uh, more like an opaque wall of force beyond the door. And then when you look to the statues and kind of look through them, they are completely hollow. Like, well, not hollow, they are completely solid. They are, there's nothing to them, there's no mechanism or anything inside of them. They seem to be nothing more than geeking. As I'm kind of doing this, my eyes are kind of just... As I'm kind of doing this, my eyes are kind of this ablaze with purple fire. It's kind of the like I'm going for with this invocation. I'm just kind of speaking to Gressel. What you ask of us is something of heroes and legend. What exactly do we get in return for this to essentially allow you to manipulate reality itself? I believe that we Fair agreed question. upon me sending you back to where you belong. I what can't... if we have no desire to go back? You wish to reside here? Oh, I've been handed a rare opportunity. You come from a time that I do not understand. It seems that Alfred was willing to pull from that which not has not been written. And for some of you, that which was written but not written pure. Things that were sharded away. The ley lines were crossed and passed. The sections were made in time itself. Some of you shouldn't exist. Looking to Ezlo. Some of you. Yes. The, uh, you said, what was it called? We know the, the heart of death, you said? We all know what that is, right? You said? Yeah. I wish to sup from the heart of death, Russell. I do not wish for death to take me now, nor ever. Then you'll I will have... get you behind this door. If you will allow, if you will agree that I will become as will the Eternal. Then you will have to find your own way back. I'm sure in the time of eternity I'll figure something out. That agreements have been made. If you are responsible, or you and yours are responsible for getting me through these doors, I will allow you to get a drink. Turns from uh, Ezlo's attention, kind of looking over to the others. I don't suppose time is a, a factor here, but I guess I'm kind of in a hurry. I've been waiting for this for some time. So just to understand, uh, Steve, you just made a bargain to benefit your character, right? Of course I did. I'm a warlock and a charlatan. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. So what, what's the benefit to the rest of us? Oh, no, no, no. He said... So Ezlo just said he's going to help, and his payment is going to be sought from the heart of death. Yeah, for the rest of us, it's he'll send us home. Or if you want to make transactional... Uh, yeah. Oh, Corso feels like he's already pretty much at fucking Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> hey, dying's not happening all over the place. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, oh my god, it's, uh, it's, oh. Oh my God! Magic everywhere. John, would 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 Bartleby know that that plane shift would not take him back to where he wants to go? If I cast. Okay, I, so I I wouldn't know for sure. Yeah, you wouldn't know for sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, as a as a time wizard, would Rakosh know how to get back without any help? Um, make an Arcana check. You can have advantage on this one. Twenty. So you would know that looking over the edge and seeing as it stands, it being kind of this weird cognizant status. Um, unless the Arch of Time is fixed, you don't think that there's a way for you to get back and beyond. Um, as it stands, with everything being as it is, you feel like you're pretty much locked where you're at. Okay. This moment seems to exist in all moments, but at the same time allow for normal temporal activity. If that makes sense. Sorry, I didn't mean to post. I was just trying to read it on my own terms. No worries. I, I, I wasn't even looking. Um, the, uh, the, whatever those statues did that destroyed my, my jug, mm -hmm. was that a spell? Do I know what it is? It wasn't a spell. 
Uh, you can make an arcana check, but based on what you've seen so far, it looks like it was radiant energy. So, would I have advantage because of a uh, complex? All that. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Because I've, I've got an idea, but I need more information before I feel like... I want to have a lot of fun with this character. It'd be a shame to just throw him away. Absolutely. Okay, so I got a 19. It was very much radiant energy, but based on like the, the nature of the destruction, it appears it was more than that. It appears that it was actually raw positive energy. Hmm. So what you presume uh, is is that your clay jug wasn't killed by having all of its hit points reduced to zero and beyond. It was given too many hit points and it exploded. Interesting. Um, I have an idea. I have an idea. Is Corso looks at the dragonborn beside him for a moment, and then he uh. He's gonna. Sorry, roll twenty is being super laggy right now. Fair enough. Um, Don't really need it right now. Oh well, he steps over here and uh, he reaches into his satchel again, and uh, you guys will immediately notice something is very weird because he reaches into this satchel that's essentially a messenger bag and he pulls out a spear. Everybody has bag of holding. <laughs> <laughs> Basi okay. Basically, what you try to do is like pick a card, any card, while you're sitting in a room full of pen and tellers, like. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't trying to be impressive. I was just, you know, sort of relaying the information. Um, but he takes the spear, he turns it around, and he takes the blunt end, he sticks it in this guy's blood, mm -hmm. and he basically draws, he writes, like, the inscriptions of two spells using this guy's blood, writes it in common on the ground, and he asks the dragonborn, do you know these spells? One of them is counter spell, and one of them is dispel magic. Which dragonborn are you asking? This one. I think he's asking me, and the answer is a no to either of them. He glances at Ezlo, and he kind of like, you can't really tell because he has a visor on, but he kind of like narrows his eyes like, no, he's probably not the one. And then he looks at the other dragonborn, and he says... Come take a look at this. Do you know these spells? I am Venkar the Dark. I serve Lord Reneth, destroyer of foes. Do I know who Reneth is? No. I know the spells you ask. I know dispel magic. I know counter spell. Okay. I may have need of your assistance. What say you? <clears throat> Once these statues begin their um, begin priming their weapons, I would like to see if they're susceptible to dispel magic. And if not... The the, like the, the 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 conversation is interjected. You hear a voice, not out loud, but in all of your heads, and it says, "That won't work." And as you kind of turn in the direction of the sound, you can feel like the tether. You kind of look over to the cloaked figure that now walks up and kind of stands or is a pile next to Eslo. Um, the face mask kind of looking at you. This isn't magic that's being cast, nor is it magic that a dispel will block. This is grand magic. It will take more than a simple third level spell to block. Do I... Th knowing that, do I think this magic would be more than enough to overcome Otto Luke's resilient spear? You can certainly try. What, try to puzzle it out or just try the spell? Try to use it, yeah. Hmm.
Venkar the Dark would move forward with his assistants and bow at the door and say, I am Venkar the Dark. How far do you I ask far? permission to pass. How far and I would you, bow. How far do you get up? Do you move between the swords or do you stay kind of back beyond the barrier? That's like obvious. right there. Okay. So if you kind of move up to it that close, nothing really happens. If you kind of step forward like one more step or a couple more steps, the blades start to glow. The vines start to glow as well. Um, like infinite, just glowing up uh, into the sky. Um, and you kind of kneel down and say your thing, nothing changes. There's still glowing swords and vines. It doesn't seem anything of its defensive nature or its posture of blocking um, has changed based on your uh, request to enter. I serve Lord Renanth, destroyer of foes, and I am a favored one, and I bow. Nothing changes. Son of a bitch! <laughs> Gets up and just kicks <laughs> like a part of the body <laughs> the dead guy. <laughs> Fucking... <laughs> um, that said... The, uh... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, are the, the beams that came out to destroy the, the toy, were they like narrow beams or was it like a wave? <laughs> yeah. It was like two like just straight walls that moved from sword to sword, kind of crossing over each other, and just kind of broke it into everything. And it wasn't, it didn't look like any sort of, like, magic or anything, it was just raw energy? Raw energy. Interesting. Um, hmm, said, and Albuquerque's convinced that no spell that we have would work? No, like he, just raw math or would we just have to be creative no he's convinced that counter spell and dispel magic will not stop it because first off it's not a spell for it to be countered and second it's not a power there, there's no way a dispel magic is going to block the gates of eternity uh this is god level magic we're talking about here all right i'll try something um kind of put my staff in the ground And the purple orb shifts quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yeah, red. Um, I'm gonna cast Wall of Force okay. using how many tokens does that? There you go. Five, uh, five charges. Okay. Um, you can draw it wherever I wanna, you like. Yeah. Is it possible to? Is it? Hold on. I want to see if it's concentration. Yeah, it's con. So I can only make one wall. I wanted to try to. I can't stack like, both of them, but. I'm going to try to block, I guess, um, one side, essentially. My goal here is essentially put a wall in front of where the beam would come out okay. um, to see how effective it is. And how do you want and to then activate I'm gonna the ask, uh, blade? It, because casting the wall well, doesn't trigger it. Creating the wall and print. No, no, I know. I'm just. I was about to ask Corso or someone, and or Corso, can you animate another object? I want to see if this will block it. Or a vent card, can you send in one of your minions just to see if it'll block the? It may be destroyed. It'll probably be destroyed by the other side. But if we can block one side, perhaps someone else can conjure another wall of force, and we we'll pass this. I need to know if wall of force will block the beam. If someone has a minion they can send through or into the line of fire, that would be helpful. I mean, if Wall of, if wall of Force works, then okay. Resilience to Fear will probably will too. So real, real quick, you place the wall. You ask for someone to move a minion. Everybody, go ahead and make sure your placement is where you want to be. And um, I want to know how you, what's moving in, what's doing what. Venkar can yeah. send a minion, and he will. All right. The um, Venkar is sending it in. I'm going to step back to the foot of the, the stairs. I don't want to stand next to these two, but I will stand over here. Perfect. He keeps an eye on the ghoul. All right. Okay. So, um... As you see the ghoul move forward, you see the blades start to activate, and as they do so, they fire. You watch as both blades move, the very first one hitting the back side of the wall of force. When it does so, instead of just stopping, you watch it ablate outwards, 
and create a perfect sphere out from it that goes infinitely in all directions. It seems to cut the gold. It seems to cut the gold, uh, with the exception of the door, uh, but it seems to kind of cut everything into its cloud-like state, infinitely upwards and infinitely outwards in a perfect line. The ghoul is the closest one to it, but isn't actually touched. And the other line hits moments after that. Because you see what's happening and are smart boys and can anticipate that, it looks like Venkar is the only one that really needs to make it. Go ahead and make a dexterity saving throw. Kevin. I can't find my character sheet. Just a second. All right. Uh, I'm looking. What it's it's a really it's a really low DC because you're seeing. I know. It. I... Wait, yeah. where am I, man? You have advantage I... as well. You know you what? Don't the want, you don't is? want to fail. <laughs> no, no. You know what the problem is? As I was drinking and like this is all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I can't even... can. I can't sheet. Where is my character sheet, man? Okay, well, I'm, let me go ahead and... No, no time out. I'll get, I, I swear no, I will no, get it. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you, because I can't. I have the no. power to just show it to you. There it no, is. No, no, I have it. What is it? Is it a dex? Yeah. Okay, I swear I will do it. I like to play by the rules, man. All right, here we go. Yes! I All freaking right. critted, guys. So you hop Get away, on. You hop away, but your um, ghoul behind you doesn't. Um, no! you, you watch as the first one... Uh, hits and does its thing. You see it and understand what's happening to step aside. You watch as your ghoul that actually at, uh, moved towards the door is obliterated. Um, I'll go ahead and just get him out of there. And then you watch as it, when it creates its its wave out, it smashes into uh, your ghoul behind you. It's too narrow a beam to mess with the homunculus. Um, and you watch as it's obliterated as well. And then, once they're gone, the wall force remains. The Light lines, you know, shoot outwards, uh, but it doesn't seem to have any effect on the door. It does, no! but it does cut through the the ground you're stepping on, which is gold, and you watch it basically obliterate the gold in a line. It kind of becomes mist for a second, and then reforms into gold. Wait, did you say it reforms the ghoul? No, into gold. Oh, I was gonna say. That was not a ghoul. That was a realivened corpse. Fair enough. I don't particularly care too much. It is gone now, is what it is. Oh. Uh, Experiment well, successful, man. gentlemen. So, under a wall of force, and we're in business. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> we have a wall of force, and how are we in business? Another wall we can of walk, force. We can stroll right past the... the, the z- Right, but we don't, have, we don't know how to open the door. You can at least access the door at that point. Right, right, okay. That's process, right. progress, yeah. Yeah, the problem, I think the problem with the... Uh, uh, I mean, it just says it can't damage anything. Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing, like, the resilient Saphir might be able to survive the attack, but it won't let me affect anything outside of it. Oh, sorry. Real quick. Um, yeah, that's. I was waiting for you to do that because you would have learned a lesson, but it wouldn't have been a fruitful one. But Venkar, uh, because of your nature, can you do me a favor and make me an Arcana check? Because you would have noticed something as your undead were being obliterated. <laughs> Venkar will make you a check. <laughs> what type of check is it? Arcana. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Okay, man. <laughs> Son of a bitch. All right. Sorry, guys. I don't, been, don't, uh, don't close your sheet ever again. <laughs> right, we, need, we need more drunk Kevin. Drunk Kevin yeah, is best Kevin. Kevin is not all that great. <laughs> I disagree. I'm... What did I get? Okay. So 20? What, what That's you, not half bad. Kevin, what Oh, you, my God. I love drunk Kevin. What you see and no one else notices is when the beam hits your ghoul uh, or your uh, reanimated corpse... Um, on the dais and also the one behind you, instead of just creating it and disintegrating it like it did with the toy, what it does to yours instead, it seems that it causes their flesh for a second, just a millisecond, but noticeable to you because of your check, 
to become no longer undead, no longer necrotic. Instead, it seems to basically revivify them for a moment into a normal living state and then obliterate them. My friends, I have noticed something. The power somehow makes my undead alive, more alive than it was. This is interesting. <laughs> Wait, did I say what really happened or did I just make that shit up? That's exactly <laughs> well, I mean, right. That's exactly it's right. In line with what happened to my construct. Hmm. That was my assistant, whom I love. <laughs> but necrophilia. We have much? learned a lot. Is it really um, necrophilia if they're animated? Like <laughs> I'm, it's it's a platonic love. It's not nasty. Yeah, it's platonic. Come on, don't get gross on us here. Um, <laughs> Corso is going to slowly, he's going to be walking around the outside of the stairs, but he's going to be approaching the statues. And he's going to do it slowly to kind of gauge their reaction. Just as Rakash did, as you approach the statues, even still, the beam swords appear and the light glows. Okay, so it's based on the proximity to the statues and not... It seems on... to just be proximity to the door, really. Oh, okay. Okay, um, Fuck. Yep, he's going to step back here. Oh, and gonna I, didn't, have... I didn't see your placement. I was just going off the theater of the mind. If you don't get that close, like touching close, like uh, Rakash was, it doesn't glow. It's only when I'm you sorry. Get a, it's only when you get, like, touching close that it'll actually start glowing. Interesting. Well, shit, man. I don't, I need, I, I don't know. Rakash, um, and, uh, Eslo, um, Bartleby, um, Again, you guys haven't actually introduced each other to each other. The only person whose name is known by any of you is Rakash. Oh, I'm sorry, and Venkar. Venkar did also make himself known. Uh, <laughs> I am Venkar. He did say that. That's a thing. Also, uh, at, while this is going on, Rakash is confident enough that once this guy fixes that thing, that he can get himself home. So he's also going to want to take a sip from the, the Death Heart. If you say that to Griselle, Griselle says, I suppose that's fine. Okay, I just want to make sure. On another note, since we're all standing here, uh, I'm going to talk to the worm guy. First off, I don't like you very much. Second off, uh, <laughs> do we think that we can maybe like dimension door or do we think the the beam won't go past behind the swords? So we might be able to like sneak around the statues maybe? Grisel kind of looks like the face, or not Grisel, sorry, the uh, Gideon kind of turns the attention to you and you say, first of all, I don't like you. And, uh, <laughs> Like, you feel the same kind of weight of um, uh, attention that um, uh, existed for a moment for Eslo. And um, it kind of saddles with you for a second. Um, and then you hear a voice in your head say, Try it. <laughs> uh, Corso looks at his little drone and he says, Any ideas? And his drone goes... Okay, so I, Venkar the Dark, I still think we should be able to ask and Just get gain, our way through. Kevin, gain inspiration. But I, uh, maybe not. <laughs> I meant to do it a while ago. He's, he's, he's a method acting man. It's just like 101. You, it's oh, all, it's you so good. a voice. Because this is not Kevin Gibson's voice. <laughs> it is Venkar the Dark's voice. Very well. I love it. Um, so drunk Kevin is named Venkar. Got it. Right. And then, so we know the two Dragonborns names, but no one's else introduced each other to each other. There's obviously a problem at hand, so you haven't really been thinking too much on it. That said, um, what are we doing? Uh, I don't know. The Wall of Force seems to be working. Still waiting for someone to, yeah, I was going to say, waiting for someone to conjure another Wall of Force. I have the ability so touch the to door. conjure a wall of force if need be, my friend. Wait, it it need be, indeed. I love your style. Uh, 
if you can put it like the other side, opposite of mine, we do can you, uh, touch you, the door. Do you do so? Let us do this, my friend. You and I grab my staff and I cast Wall of Force as he casts Wall of Force. Before he does that, I'm going to move in a way that I know that the beams would, from from the last experience, Damn. would not f- would not fly out. Fair. Go ahead, Chad. You're muted. I was just going to say that you know before he puts down the other Wall of Force and they enact this plan. Corso is going to do the math and figure out where the safest place to so stand. So what's is. happening is is when it hits, it's creating a perfect line wall that goes south from where it hits. So based on the what you've seen of it, it's basically just going to hit and shoot straight down for eternity and straight up for eternity in a perfect circle that just continues outwards. Um, you, If you actually like are cognizant and kind of paying attention, you kind of look out and you can actually still see the last wave continuing on into the sky, way off in the distance. Like, there's a perfect, like, ring that's expanding outwards eternally from it. And you think it hit Urz at some point to the bo- like beneath you? It doesn't seem to have done anything there, but it just seems to continually be going out into the sky. You know what would be absolutely fucking hilarious? Hmm. If us trying to solve this puzzle is the calamity that decimated my future. <laughs> And then just this big old beam of white positive energy destroyed everything. I called it the Karening. (laughs) Anyways, do you wish to move forward now that there are two walls of force blocking the passageway? Yeah, I'll I'll move a little bit forward. Of course, having everyone move inside of the walls so that they are not barred from the external portion. And Rakash, as you step forward towards the door, you see the lights, the swords the beams on the outside and you watch as and you kind of get into place you're kind of like (laughs) this kills me i'm haunting you bro step forward and you see both of the beams on the sides of the green uh ish colored walls of force detonate and shoot out like they did before um you have access to the door and as long as you stand there those beams are continually going so there's just these two large white walls of destruction or absolute healing that continue on for eternity um, uh, constant reconstruction <laughs> right how long do walls of force last yeah that is also something i need to know i it's, think we just lost it, um it's currently up on the, the docket there it's 10 minutes 10 minutes okay yeah uh i'm gonna oh man dang it steve <laughs> um, uh, there he is i'm gonna put my hand on the door do I lose my hand? Um, no. Um, okay. So you do feel a uh, certain kind of um, rush of warmth, though. Uh, not in a bad way, not like you're touching a hot stove. More like you're uh, walking into a nice warm house. Like the fire's been going for a long time, like a dog sitting in your lap, or, you know, like there's just a, a positive warmth to you kind of touching this door. Okay. Feels- when I try to push into it, does it push open? It does not. Okay. So we can touch it now, boys. What are we going to do about getting it actually open? Does someone have the knock spell prepared? <laughs> no, that, op- that opens doors. I-, I hear. You hear a voice in your head as low. I doubt it will work. What's going to work, voice in my head? And I say right? that out loud. <laughs> you say what? Well, lots what? of ideas from some, ho- some powerful, legendary... Uh, mages, and I'm looking at uh, Gideon over Gideon, right? Yeah. Man who makes a continent open a door, you know? He, um, uh, the figure kind of like looms uh, at you, kind of looking at you, and you can see it kind of rising up, like kind of staring at you with its eyeless holes, and it says, I have not made a deal with that one. The fact that I'm helping you at all, and it's saying this in a telepathic way, but everyone can hear it. It's kind of like a very loud telepathy. (laughs) The fact that I'm helping you at all is something you should be appreciative of. And I'm sorry if I'm not racking my mind over how to open this door to help this one. I do not know its ends. If you Strange that you said you were helping us and not racking your mind in the same sentence. 
I'm not. I'm keeping my distance from horrible beams of destruction. And making sure I'm wary of what you're doing so it's not something that's wasteful. I, Venkar, have a question for the dungeon master. <laughs> what is your question? How come I only have <laughs> John, one... John and Frey's just sitting there. Yeah, 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 Venkar, what? <laughs> How come I only have one ghoul when I started with... Because when you should have, have, I should have two no, left no, no. at the moment. No, because when you hit the two lines against the wall of force by sending the first one up, it accidentally killed another one. So you lost two in one shot. Venkar would say, "You are a motherfucker." If you, if you want, though, there is a headless corpse there that you could animate. Oh, I was thinking of recycling that. Nice piece of meat. <laughs> You've apparently slain Joe. Uh, <laughs> this is quite possibly one of the best things ever. Yeah, <laughs> I 100% agree. But Rakash, the door is not its not budging. There doesn't appear to be any mechanism. There doesn't appear to be any markings other than the weird kind of glyphy marks. There do appear to be kind of dragon heads in the markings. But there's nothing that's kind of situating like a puzzle to you. There's no... Um, there's no, there's nothing to solve here hmm. that you can see. Uh, I'm going to, just just out of curiosity, I'm going to go over and dip, like... R sorry, one last thing. It is still glowing bright white, though, just like the swords, but the swords are still shooting their beams into the walls of force. Okay. Uh, before the walls of force run out, I'm going to run back to the body and yep. dip my hand in a little bit of blood and then run back to the door and then put my hand on it. And I've been more than fair. Um, so what I'm going to let you know is, is we are currently, go I'm, I'm saddling it into, it's currently in the two minute mark. So you have eight minutes left remaining. So at exactly 10.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, those walls of force will drop. I know they were in Simo, but the okay. first one will drop at that point. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to maybe put some blood against it and see what happens. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Well... You well, can fellas, do it, my brother. Yeah, I might be able to do it, Bubs, but I'm gonna need some helps. Okay. Um, I have an idea as well. You go first, Chad. Doesn't say anything. He he is mindful of the walls of force and the shit going on behind them. Um, he doesn't think this will work, but it. Looking around, he seems like he is the most capable one to try this approach. He approaches the door. He's cracking his knuckles. Um, flexing his hands, and he very calmly, uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell my, uh, actually, I don't think I need, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell my, um, I'm going to have my drone give me the help action. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just try to, like, brute force it. Nothing happens. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't even shake or sh uh, move at all. It, it, it feels like, you know, you were pushing the earth. And then, you know, to, to sort of kind of save face after, like, like doing that, he he just, he takes his hands off, and then he goes, dum dum. That's sturdy. That's sturdy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, do we think... Then he retreats to a safe distance again. Okay. Do we think Dimension Door will go through? Again. Don't fall. So, real, real quick. I've, I've given you the information I've given you. And, uh, yeah, you, you, you know what you know. You can try what you want, but I, I've been more than helpful. No, no, I'm asking as my, my character is asking the okay. rest of the party. Oh, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, go nuts. Uh, no, I, I tell him it won't work. There's I saw behind that door, it's a wall of pure, like, blocking magic. Like, it weren't... The door, it's clearly the door has to be open for that to dissipate. No okay. matter how. Yeah, I think even higher level spells like teleport won't have much effect here. Do I know what the connection is between this headless corpse and this whole thing is? Do you? I think Venkar knows. He is going to walk over and scoop up the body and put it on his shoulders as he walks. Mm -hmm. And he is going to walk up to the door and he is going to push on it and say 
the corpse. Ben Carr. Right, wait, you're, my... pushing, you're pushing the corpse on the uh, the door. No, the corpse is on my shoulders. Yeah, yeah. But I'm push on the door and say, Venkar okay. requests I entry. Hold on. So as you do that and you're saying those words, all of you watch as the head starts to manifest on the body for a second and kind of form out. And then you watch as the body kind of slacks and kind of falls off of Venkar as it stiffens and hits the ground. But it looks like his head basically regrew uh, back into its normal form. That's some kick-ass necromancy, man. It doesn't appear to be necromancy. It appears to be the opposite. The opposite, yeah. Uh -huh. It's like romancy. Life romancy. It's, so is Alfred back to life now, or he just has a head? He just has a head. So if we push get the head and bring it up here, will the body regrow? Yep. So um, as you're kind of funneling with that, you drop the body. It's kind of laying there. Um, it does seem to be kind of twitching as well. And you watch as Griselle very quickly walks over to the body, grabs a hold of the hair, and starts dragging the body away from you. No, 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 no. <laughs> Gressel <laughs> says. Um, you watch as the body kind of goes with uh, Gressel, um, and you see that long knife come back out of the scarves, and it's placed against the neck, and he starts wrenching the head off again. He throws that head next to the other head and drops the decapitated body on the ground. Uh... Sorry, so just being near the door started to regenerate it? Touching. So Venkar touched it, and the body on it started to regenerate on him. So All right. You, what do you guys think about at, just asking Alfred, like, what if, can we, let's put a head up to the door so it can get to a point where he can talk, and we'll just t make him tell us how to go through. Gressel says, I warn you, if you bring him back, it could be problematic. As I stated, looking over to Rakosh like, sympath like for sympathy, this one is Wily. If given a chance, he will cause more problems than it's worth. What could he do? Just be ahead. Even so, anybody that's willing to break the time thing is not someone you want alive. It may not be something that you're aware of, which, but spells can be cast with only verbal components. Well, I'm sure we've got a, at least a couple counter spells among the seven of us, or whoever. That is true. I think I know how to get into the door. And I would walk up, and I would, like, start doing, like, a cool dance, you know? Not, like, an uncool dance. A cool dance, and then I would, like, I would, like, moonwalk backwards towards the door. So? I, I want to say that in response to Ezlo's counterspell comment, um, Corso, like, pulls his revolver and, like, cocks the hammer and says, you're right about that. <laughs> So you, you moonwalk towards the door. Was there something else, or was it just you being uh, uh, awesome? That's awesome. Oh, he Straight awesome. Have, this... he, doesn't, he doesn't even have his headset on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, he can hear us. That's right. He doesn't have a headset situation anyways. Are you doing anything else of Encar, though? No, I'm kind of... I'm kind of... I'm thinking I should be let in just because of who I am. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's the bouncer here that I need to pay off? <laughs> Makes sense to me. Okay, uh, we've already tried everything. Well, brute force doesn't work. Some of our spells ain't working. So, team. Gressel, how do you know how Alfred originally got entrance? I brought him here. But how I, did he get through the door to manipulate things? I do not know. I wasn't here at that time. That was well before my existence and you won't let us bring him back to ask him he's more trouble you know than he's worth. is it possible back to a point where he's alive but still incapacitated the problem with this one is he's always alive but always dead at the same time could we, we do it in like a controlled setting so maybe bring him back inside a resilient sphere uh, broke... Let me explain. Let me finish my plan. Explaining my plan, my friends. If we can bring him back, but not um, cognizant, I can turn him into my thrall, my pawn, and he. We, I can command him to tell me. I seriously doubt you will be able to overpower his mind. Even with my create thrall feature, so the create that I've been granted. 
feature, um, it it uh, incapacitated Who is him. This but, Kevin? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Bring it to a point where he's incapacitated. Hit him with the tentacle mind magic. Now he's my homie, or he's my. As he's you're my discussing that, you hear kind of a loud kind of, whoosh, and then uh, the lights probably were actually gone by that point because they were kind of moved away from it anyways. But it looks like Benkar was kind of close. But the lines shoot for a second and then are no longer shooting out anymore. The walls of force are gone. You don't think, but you feel his power is beyond to be uh, manipulated in such a way? Corso is getting annoyed. He shoots pieces of statues in the head. Yep, so they're, they dent. Um, it looks like you're able to dent the gold. He just goes, hmm. Lowers his gun. He doesn't holster it, but he was frustrated, so, you yeah. know, five shots. Those of you uh, who aren't familiar with firearms, um, big loud sound, big loud sound. Big iron plays in the background. Mm-hmm. Big iron on his hoop, but not anymore because that's copyright. <laughs> Eslo! Eslo, my friend! Can you do this again? I can. But first, let's... We know that will part will work. We need to think about the follow-up once we are able to access the door. What's the next step? I'm told or implied that uh, I won't be able to manipulate Alfred. Gressel looks to you. I will not allow you to try it. If he's brought back to sustenance, I will do the same again. And again, and again, and again. Until there are so many heads piled in that stack there that it goes beyond the height of this very door. And I will explain to you once again why, if he is allowed any form of control, he will utilize it. As though, my friend, let me recycle, or as I like to call it, aliven the body for my own purposes later. Do not worry about this one. We can. We will do something different. But I do not understand why my backward dancing does not inspire a uh, pass through that door. Real quick note, Eslo, you are aware of magic that allows someone, specifically necromancers, to talk with dead bodies, even if they're dead, so long as they have that spell in their, you know, allotment. Uh, speaking with it always caught me as a religious thing stayed away from that kind of divine magic but I do not I have the spell to speak with dead because I would rather enliven them to be my assistants anyways I would agree with that sentiment alright so before you throw up more walls of force and start clocks, uh, take what you have into account. First off, the one known as Alfred the Untimely is such a threat to Gressel that if it is brought back to life for even a moment, uh, utilizing the strange positive nature of the door and the swords, that Gressel will engage it immediately and destroy him. Second... The door itself is what you want to bypass. It is made of solid gold, goes up for infinity, and seems to be barred behind it with a pure wall of light energy as well. When the door is approached, light energy forms in the statue's swords, and once you get to a certain point close to the door, will cause a beam to shoot from sword to sword. Uh, this seems to enliven a creature beyond its normal capacity for health and destroy it therein. Okay, so out of character, I have two ideas. Either it's a pull door and we've been pushing this entire time, <laughs> or there we need no, to say or we need to say open sesame there twice. Are no, there are no handles and uh, talking to the door has done nothing thus far. 
Actually, it's open sesame. Venkar likes this idea. Um, do those swords look like they can be removed? No. Well, it's worth a shot. Do they look like, uh, well, no. No, that's a dumb question. I don't think Bigby's hand will work. I don't think it's possible. I think it's, it's possibly even remotely strong enough. The main thing is it seems to be emboldened. Like all of the functions of the door seem to be emboldened with healing power. Uh, anyone got some? We gotta, we gotta hit it with some negativity. I know what to do. We gotta tell it it's ugly. We will cast some nasty necromancy because it is a taboo and people do not like it. Even though it is really pretty cool shit. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to read spells, but they're linking. That's fine. I'm not really looking at the chat. Uh, so, yeah, what are you casting? What are you doing? I've been playing D&D with Kevin for years, and like he has said more swear words in the past hour. He's drunk. Than, <laughs> and, I mean, I'm not mad about it. It's just incredible. This I, is I, the I, side I, of Kevin I never knew existed. I dig it. This is a very great first game with Kevin. This is not Kevin. This, this ben is Ben Carr the Sorry, Dark. Ben Carr. And let me tell you, Venkar the Dark has two two spells he recommends for this. Maybe I, I, I of Light, I which causes a lot. Wait, hold on, hold on. I thought that was going to be followed up with the ah, ah, ah. The Uncola. Ah, ah, ah. Three. Uh, uh, uh. I remember the Uncola. Yes. Ribbons of Night, which is a great necrotic damage type spell, or Grave Betrayal, which will revive an un, a dead being and bring them unto your wishes. So I'm thinking uh, possibly Ribbons of Night would be the best bet in this case. Okay. Tell me what you're doing. Venkar, now that we have discussed this, he is definite that this is the way to go. He is going to do a very, very, like, a lots of movement and coolness to his spell. And he's going to even do a leg kick like this. <sighs> like a cool-ass leg kick. <laughs> and as he does that, he casts the spell Ribbons of Night, okay. which is a cool-ass Necromatic spell. Go ahead and throw it down. I will click it and you will see. I mean, I already know what it does. I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> it didn't show, I could didn't show the spell. No, that's fine. Um, so <laughs> That's really uncool, man. It just showed the damage. Yeah, so what you want to do is if you go into your character sheet in your spell list, Yeah. when you have a spell that you're writing in, you typically want to... Um, let me cog it here. Let me fix it. You are going to want to put include spell description in attack and close and go ahead and click it again. Wait a minute. You just did that for me. Yep. Did Wait, you click? remember I was giving you a hard time before? I take that back. That's fair. <laughs> so 31 is the first roll. We're going to go with that and the damage roll that you rolled there. So you watch as a dark tendril forms in Venkar the dark's hand. He throws it forward. The ribbon kind of slaps into the area. You watch as the beams don't do anything. Um, he's kind of standing back. The, the place is not even lit. Um, and as the uh, ribbon hits the door, you watch as instead of turning completely white, um, everything becomes black. So the, the beams of light coming from the swords are black? The beams of light are now black and the door lights like the weird filigree that turned white when you uh, touched it um, and got close to it. Those are all black now. Black for infinity all the way up. Just darkness. Okay. What would you like to do? That is why, my wizard friends, you should all study necromancy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Taking a guess, 
out of character. Yeah, yeah. He just made that instead of doing the he the overwhelming healing. I'm assuming he just switched it to the reverse. I don't know. That is that is my guess. Do you just stand around and wait for a moment? Uh, I don't want to die. No. Me and my assistant will walk. Assistant, very assistant first. No, no, me first, man. Because I know I have just done what is awesome. Okay. I walk directly into that damn door. No. As he approaches the door, you watch as nothing happens. You move up to the door and do you touch it? Okay. As you do so, you all hear a loud kind of cracking sound as it looks like the door's middle line breaks open. And you watch as the door opens. You see Gressel kind of go <laughs> and s like kind of twitter the metal uh, fingertips. Um, as the door breaks open, though, uh, you expect to see... I don't know what you expect to see. What you're thinking is going to be beyond the doors. Um, but what you do happen to see, instead of uh, presumptions, uh, you see what is actually beyond. And what is actually beyond appears to be complete a complete hellscape. Uh, just horrific and terrible destruction. It looks like the plane that you are looking in on now through this door appears to be twisted in such a form that it all kind of bends inwards towards a center point. At that center point, it looks like twisted metal and blades have kind of formed up in the center. And standing on top of that weird ball of metal in the center is the old man with his head in a slightly younger countenance, but still the same kind of outfit and attire. And you can recognize him from his uh, look uh, as being the same guy. He's not wearing burlap pants. Uh, he instead is wearing black robes with kind of green um, uh, ribbons that kind of come down uh, like a, a untie or unset scarf uh, over his shoulders and down the front of him. And as you see him kind of um, standing there, you see Gressel kind of like happy go, fuck. Like, <laughs> and those of you that are close enough, you hear, fuck. Um, as that happens, um, you also notice that Gideon kind of takes a more like defensive posture, dropping low, and the one on top of it says, Perfect. I've been meaning to escape, and you've just made it so much easier. And it just feels like this individual is very much in control of the place that they are in. And it looks like you've just freed them, and Gressel unwittingly asked you to do so. That is where we'll end the very first session of the Here I wanted game. to shoot him with a lightning bolt. The patron game. Uh, out of character note, description, if you didn't get it, Kevin and Andy, it's mainly for you, but that would be the Valley Yard. Um, currently in one of the demonic planes, and the gate that you just broke open is one of the gates of Ashtar, not the gate of eternity. Ah, thanks for watching. Oh boy, we've been tricked. Next session of the patron game will be posted in our Discord. Um, I'll try and put a notice of it on the Twitch, uh, but it will be entitled Time. Thanks for watching Killing the Stream, and see you when we see you.